Now I would say this, most doctors are gonna do this. They're gonna check something called serum folic acid. Okay, serum folic acid is not a good way to measure your folate status. What you want is you want intracellular folate, not folic acid, folate measured. Now let's talk about the difference between folate and folic acid. Now there's, there's more than one form of folate, but the most biologically available and active form of folate is called methyl folate. Remember, when you, when you take in folate in a diet, you're, you know, it, it, it comes in many different forms, but ultimately the one that your body uses effectively to do all these things that we've been talking about is the methylated version. Okay, and that, remember the job of that MTHFR gene is to methylate folate. It's to add a methyl group to folates so that it can activate and do its job. Now, folic acid's not the same thing. What is folic acid? It is a synthetic folate. It's not found anywhere in nature. It's synthetic and it's used to fortify foods. Uh, a number of years ago, it's probably about 30 years ago, neural tube defects, we were talking about that a minute ago, were on the rise. And so there was some research showing that folate would, would deficiency would lead to neural tube defects. So um, food scientists in the United States got together and said, look, let's, let's fortify the food with synthetic folic acid. It's like when you look on a box of cereal, bread, pasta, when you look on like the orange juice or the milk and you're seeing that folic acid, this is a synthetic folate. Now the problem with that, that we know with synthetic folate, is some research says that it promotes certain kinds of cancers. And this is one of the things I don't, I don't recommend looking at, at, at using a supplement that is folic acid. And I don't really, and a lot of people are screaming right now, a lot of scientists are screaming, we need to take the fortification of folic acid out of foods. It's not the proper way to add folate to the diet. This stuff is synthetic and it leads to issues, health problems. Even though it's led to less neural tube defects, it's creating other problems. And so if we just do the right thing by putting the right type of folate in the food, I think we'd be better off. So again, some research shows that synthetic folic acid promotes cancer. It also bogs down the methylation pathway. It causes your body to need a lot more zinc to activate it, and so it can actually increase the risk for zinc deficiency. As a matter of fact, folic acid greater than 350 micrograms um, per day, rather, has been shown to reduce zinc levels. And why is that important? Because zinc plays a role in 700 different biochemical reactions inside the body. We start interfering and lowering zinc we, we can develop DNA mutations, we can develop the increased risk for a number of different cancers, we can make our immune system shut down and be more prone to colds, flus, and other types of infectious disease. Zinc is important for digestive enzyme production, it's an important antioxidant. So if you're eating a bunch of folic acid in your fortified foods and you're getting more than that 350 micrograms a day, you could be also depleting your zinc. And again, this may be one of the reasons why it does actually contribute to an increased risk for cancer. So again, the other place you want to check this is this is especially true if you have RA, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, doctors oftentimes prescribe a medic medicine called methotrexate. Methotrexate is an anti-cancer drug, but they use it. It's also known as a disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug or a DMAR. And this medicine, um, it blocks folate. And so a lot of rheumatologists prescribe folic acid knowing that this drug blocks folate. So, so doctors prescribe folic acid. Now again, if you talk about prescription folic acid, it's the synthetic version. This is something I don't understand about rheumatologists. We have better options than synthetic folic acid. And so in this regard, my, my recommendation would be to talk to your rheumatologist about methylfolate, not, syn not synthetic Folic acid, methyl folate, more specifically 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate or 5-MTHF, which can be, you know, you can buy it over the counter as a supplement, but it is the methylated version of folate, not the synthetic version, and so you're not going to get that same effect. But it, if supplementing with methyl folate handles or helps if you're taking methotrexate to offset 
methotrexate actually creating a major problem for you with folate, you know, again, with folate deficiency. So important to recognize that. Now on that same topic, let's slide this over. Oh, we're running out of room here. Let's slide this over and let's talk about some of those medicines that we know interfere with folate. So drugs that reduce folate. Okay, so number one, I just mentioned methotrexate. So again, if you're on methotrexate to treat your rheumatological arthritis, you know that methotrexate can hinder folate. Number two, metformin. Metformin's a medicine oftentimes used to help with blood sugar. This is a diabetic medication, but we know metformin directly causes folate deficiency. Number three, aspirin. So those of you maybe have heart disease, your doctor has told you to take aspirin to keep your blood thin. This can also cause folate deficiency as well. So you got to be careful here. Number four, antibiotics. There are a number of different antibiotics that can interfere with folate. Some of the folate is actually produced by our probiotics, by our good healthy bacteria. So antibiotics knocking out those good bacteria can actually reduce your level of probiotics as well. So if you're prescribed any of these different medications here, you just want to be aware that folate deficiency can be a problem as a result of that. Now we can add to this list, we can put diuretics on this list. Um, and most commonly diuretics are prescribed to lower blood pressure. So again, if you're diabetic and you have high blood pressure and you're on a diuretic and you're on metformin, okay, this is kind of a double hit for you. The diuretics don't just deplete folate, they can deplete other B vitamins as well. Remember too that excessive caffeine use would classify as a diuretic, so you have to be careful in that regard as well. Um, let's see here. Alcohol is not really technically a drug, but I think bears mentioning, especially this time of the year when people are drinking a lot more right now, but alcohol is notorious for creating not just low folate, but also low B vitamins as a whole. So Again, if you're taking any of these medicines or doing any of these things kind of leisurely, some people do the big caffeine drinks, the Red Bulls and the, and the other um, kind of mega caffeine drinks, the Mountain Dews, et cetera. You know, you've got to be aware that if you're creating and you're doing multiple of these things, you're potentially inhibiting your ability to absorb folate. You're potentially inhibiting the ability for the folate you have to be utilized properly. And so you're running that risk. And folate deficiency is not something that you want to mess around with. Um, Okay, so that should cover most of our meds with folate. Let's move on to some foods. Let's talk about some of these foods that, um, that are richer in folate. Now, this actually, there's a misnomer here. This says potassium rich, but we could really say these are potassium rich as well, but they're also folate rich foods. If it's green, it's got folate in it. Um, so this is your lettuce, your spinach, uh, your cauliflower, your, your chard, um, your Brussels sprouts, etc., your asparagus, asparagus, but also that what's not on here is a very rich source of folate, which is liver. Okay, liver, um, so those of you who um, maybe are on a carnivore diet or maybe you're, you've been told that you, know, you have to eat more vegetables um, to get folate. You can get a lot of folate out of liver. You can also get folate. What's not on this list are your, some of your nuts are also rich in folate as well. So these are just other sources of folate. So a number of different dietary sources of folate, but just remember if it's green, it's got a lot of folate in it. And that's, that's going to generally speaking be a good source. So if you're not a big green eater, you need to consider nuts. You need to consider adding uh, potentially liver into your diet to make sure you're getting adequate levels of folate. Now, if you're supplementing with folate, I mentioned earlier um, not to use folic acid. Let's move this out of the way. Um, and that you would really want to go with a better version. There's two decent versions. I'll say put them in order. There's folinic acid, which you might see in a supplement. And then there's also... 5-methyl-tetrahydrofolate, or 5-MTHF. Now this is, in my opinion, the best form. It is the active form of folate, the one that will drive those methylation cycles for you so that you're producing serotonin 
and dopamine and glutathione and bile and making new DNA and RNA in a healthy way. This is the active version. Now, folinic acid will also work really well. Now, remember, folinic acid is not the same thing as folic acid. This is natural, too. This is a folate in a natural form. So either one of these would be okay. Now, most supplements are going to contain, generally speaking, 400 micrograms you know, for a pill, for, for a one kind of oral dose, bolus dose. So 400 micrograms. Um, if you're a pregnant woman, you know, it's generally recommended you get at least 800 to 1,000 micrograms because of the increased growth. So you need more during pregnancy. This is what we were talking about earlier with neural tube defects. So again, um, a lot of your ladies, a lot of the prenatal vitamins don't contain folate. They contain folic acid. So I can't emphasize it enough. 5-MTHF, very important to look for that ingredient if you're going to supplement with folate orally. So um, beyond that, you should get plenty in your diet if you're eating some of those foods. Now, if you have an MTHFR mutation, couple of points. Number one, having a mutation does not mean you're, you're broken. A lot of people come to me and they say, Dr. Osborne, I have this mutation and that, that's it's hopeless. You know, I'm not going to be able to do things properly. My body's never going to repair or heal. This is, this is poppycock in its highest sense. A mutation doesn't mean you're broken. A mutation means you have to be extra cautious about your choices in life. A mutation gives you a disadvantage, but it doesn't make you sick, okay? A mutation and bad choices makes you sick. So if we say mutation plus bad choices, well, what is a bad choice? A bad choice is you're eating fast food. A bad choice is you're, you're um, not sleeping adequately. A bad choice is you're being exposed to massive quantities of chemicals in your cosmetics or in your hair care products or other things. The bad choices is that you eat a diet that maybe is the wrong diet for you as a unique person. So aside from the common sense rule of we can't get healthy eating food that's not healthy, some people are sensitive to certain foods or allergic to certain foods. And so those would be examples of bad choices. Not getting adequate sunshine, bad choice. Not getting adequate sleep, not getting adequate exercise, eating the wrong diet, chemical exposures. Those are, when I say bad choices, Again, and sometimes you may not, you may, may, may making bad choices, not even know you're making bad choices because you don't have specific information about what your body needs specifically. But I think most people could agree that exercise, sunshine, and sleep, and healthy food are all things that everybody can pretty much agree on um, are, are the antithesis to bad choices, right? So it's where people fail in those decisions and they have a mutation that that mutation starts to show up as problematic. It kind of let me give you an analogy. It would kind of be like, let's say that that your job was to run marathons, but you were a horrible marathon runner, like you were not genetically gifted to run long distances. You can run really fast for short distances, but the second the distance goes up over a couple of miles, your body starts to break down and you do really terribly. Now imagine if that was you, if you had a a poor genetic ability to perform athletically in marathons and your job every day was to run marathons. How healthy would you be if that was what your job was? You would actually, your health would be destroyed slowly over time. And this is what I'm referring to. The mutation doesn't make you sick. The mutation plus your environment and your environment is typically those bad choices is what predisposes you more greatly to developing a problem. So keep that in mind. Those of you that have an MTHFR mutation, all is not lost. All hope is not um, forever lost. So, so got to keep that in mind. Otherwise, you get, you get depressed just thinking about it. So remember, a mutation doesn't create disease. A mutation plus bad choices increases the risk for the development or the probability for the development of disease. But by itself, a mutation does not lead to disease. I actually have this mutation and I'm perfectly healthy. As far as I know, all my lab tests and everything else, as far as I know, I'm perfectly healthy and you can be too. And if you're struggling, don't blame your genes, right? Look at your choices and ask yourself, am I, can I, and should I be making different choices or better choices? Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.